Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Lazy Entrepreneur. We're your host. We're your hosts. I can't say host. <laughs> not this is a problem again. we've had in every Just, episode. No, it's not. You've made this up in the last few episodes. Just say hosts and continue. It's not a word you get stuck on. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Lazy Entrepreneur. We're your hosts, Sam and Emma Priestley. Hello. Can you hear that outside? It I sounds can. like um, Santa's sleigh. <laughs> Basically, we're on an island in the middle of nowhere, really, where the only transport around the island is by a horse and cart. They don't allow anything with an engine on the island. As you can imagine, the Wi-Fi isn't that great, so we're spending the time to record a few podcasts. Yep. And catch up on uh, some TV series that we haven't been watching. In particular, we've been watching Breaking Bad. And there was a quote from Jesse, who is one of the main characters in Breaking Bad, that uh, resonated with me a little bit. He said, what's the point of being an outlaw if you've got responsibilities? Mm. Yeah, it makes me think about why did I get into whatever it is I'm doing in the first place. And I think it sums up quite a lot of the journey that I've had and maybe we've both had in the last 10 years. I always wanted to become an entrepreneur, not because of being an entrepreneur, but to have like complete control over my everything I do. In your life, not just your work life. Yeah, I wanted to have control of my time. I wanted to choose when I get up in the morning. I like to tell the story of um, just having a great time at university and then the idea of having to get up in the morning to go and work at a bank or something just absolutely terrified me. That's why I started trying to find other ways to make money. Who's your motivation? That was my motivation. My motivation was I wanted to be able to have that lie in. I wanted to be able to play video games all day. And still Um, earn money. Yeah. But I never particularly wanted to be rich or successful. But at university you were quite driven by money. Yeah, because I went for a phase of getting into the whole glamorous side of being like a stockbroker. I thought that was quite cool. Yeah, you had loads of silly posters. I had a couple of silly posters. I had, um, I went and visited a few stockbrokers to get their take on what it was like. Did you? Yeah, yeah. I went and um, asked for advice from, you know, you've always got friends and acquaintances who are like, oh yeah, John's dad is a successful stockbroker. <laughs> so I went and met up with John's dad and he gave me his worldly wisdom. What, what and they was recommended the... books and I read those books and... And what was your takeaway? That you wanted to be there? Yeah, not so much I wanted to be there, but I thought well, that's a really cool life. It just seemed like a good way, quite a glamorous way to make a bunch of money. But then it didn't take long before I realised actually what I want is not to work really hard and make less money, but to have control over my time and do what I want to do. Which brings us back to this quote, you know, what's the point of being an outlaw? What's the point of being an entrepreneur? What's the point of being self-employed? if you've got responsibilities. And that, that is what I found with quite a lot of the businesses that I started over the years. So I ended up creating a business, which end goal was to give me as much free time and control over my life as possible. Ended up having more responsibility and more sort of self-imposed requirements on my time than if I'd just gone and got a job. It, like I did a tech startup. We got a whole episode on it. And... One thing about that was we had an office and I had employees and I had the key to the office. So I had to be there before everyone turned up each day to like unlock the office and get in. And I had to be the last person at the end of the day to lock up. And like that is the opposite of what I wanted. Yeah, when you're at university, that's that was your nightmare. It's like having a job, but worse. Yeah. And I used to think it was a bit weird that banks were more... It'd be easier to get a job as an employee of my business than as the owner of my business. But actually, that makes sense because the first person to get paid in the business is the employees. Yeah. The owner is the last one to get paid. He takes his cut out of the profits. If the business is not making any money, he's the first one not to get paid the salary. And I had that in some other businesses as well, where the money went straight to the employees and the people working for the business ended up making more out of it than I ever did, even though the businesses might have been class successful. The kind of the people around there end up doing better than me. Not on all businesses, but on some of them. The one, the more like mediocre ones. 
And I think that's something that's changed about the way I approach business now, not just in the startup phase, but in the growth phase and then in kind of the end goals. Yeah, because whenever you start a business in the last few years, the focus has been on how can you make it a passive income? How can you put in loads of work now that will mean it can just tick over without a huge amount of effort day in, day out? Yeah, that's true. So there's there's kind of two uh, parts of businesses that take responsibility. So mm-hmm. one of them is a business that just requires non-stop work and growth. Yes. So a good like example would be like the tech startup that I was yeah. talking about. So I wasn't really doing the day-to-day stuff, but the nature of the business itself meant that it needed me all in on it and it needed me constantly trying to grow it because it wasn't a business that was going to ever make money that would pay a salary. The whole point of the business was to get it really uh, popular, probably lose money for quite a long time, get a lot of equity value and then get in loads of investment or sell the business for a lot of money. And that only works if you're 100% in. Yeah. It's like if you watch Dragon's Den or Shark Tank and the question comes up with, are you doing anything else? And the person says, well, actually, I've got a full-time job on the side. And the dragons or the sharks will only invest in the business if the founder is all in. Yeah. So that's that type of business is that by the nature of the business itself, you've got to be all in, that kind of start up the business. And then there's another type of business, which maybe that's not necessarily that important, but where the stuff you're doing requires a lot of responsibility. So an example of that be if I was uh, screen printing t-shirts in my flat and I got an order for it on the website, I then have my, you know, it will be with you within three days policy. So I now have this three day limit window in order to get the t-shirt, print it, stick the thing on, put it in the post and make sure it gets to the person. And they're quite different businesses because one of them is scalable and one of them isn't. Yes. So one of them is inherently a bad business. And so I say, like, you should never be doing a business where you are the bottleneck for yeah. growth. And that's something that we definitely try not to have. And I think that's one of the big things we've achieved with, say, Pipe House Gin, which is our gin business, is that, for instance, we've got a big contract that's just uh, about to come through with English Heritage. And one of their things is that, we have to agree that when they place an order, it's got to be with them in whatever one of their locations within seven days. Yeah. Now, if that, if we were the ones delivering that, if we had our little warehouse that we go down to and we get an order for Edinburgh and that we have to drive to, we got to go to our warehouse, pick it up, get in the car and drive all the way up there. We are a bottleneck to business and we've got that responsibility that we've got no control over ourselves we can't go on holiday for more than a few days we've got to be very wary about accepting these contracts because if you don't fulfill them you know you're you're potentially faced with fines or you can lose the business altogether Mm. you're the bottleneck that the business might be profitable but if you've built it with the idea that you're doing all the work then it's hard to value that in and that's something I think we've done quite well. We built our business, Pipe House Gin, from the get-go that we can deal with that scale and we can fulfill orders like that. Yeah. So, as I said, you know, we're on a random island at the moment. We're still getting orders through, but the orders we can just put through online on our, on our little dashboard because we've outsourced the warehousing, we've outsourced the actual making of the gin, the distilling, you know, we create the recipe, so we have full control over that. It's fully our brand, but in terms of scalability, everything else is outsourced. Yeah, and also um, there isn't really any time pressure on anything. We don't need to be looking at emails 24-7, for example. I think you've put your, your finger on another really important point, which is that a lot of entrepreneurs, even when they've built a kind of scalable business that doesn't involve them in the day-to-day, stuff like emails is still they consider responsibility yep. and that brings us on to kind of that other type of business where even though they're not the ones doing the day-to-day job they're still 100 percent responsible for every decision everything everything and that is managing your employees even if you're not running day-to-day you still got to be in the office running your employees you still got to be checking your emails 24 7 so we went for dinner a few days ago with a couple of um, entrepreneurs who run a really successful recruitment firm i'm sure they make much more money than we do uh, but every 15 minutes or so they're on their phones replying to emails yep 
We didn't look at our emails once. Once, and didn't feel the need to. Didn't feel the need to. And if we had no internet for a week, it wouldn't have mattered that much. No. It might have been a bit annoying, but it wouldn't have had too big an impact. And you can see them, like, they were getting quite a few drinks in as well. So oh, yeah. they were drinking their vodka and tonics and going a little bit tipsy, and they're still having to send their, their work emails. Yeah, and, uh, and there are a couple that work together, so sometimes they actually had to discuss the email. It wasn't even a case of they knew how to reply. That's mm. the thing that really surprised me. They were actually managing it while drunk in a bar. And their digital nomads, which yes. is something else to add. They're ones who've purposely tried to build a business that means they can run it remotely while travelling the world. Yeah, and coming away from that, those drinks at that dinner it made me really appreciate the fact that we don't have any businesses that are like that. There's nothing that is so urgent that can't wait for us to um, deal with it in the morning. And this brings us back to the whole topic of this subject, of this uh, podcast, which is what's the point of being an entrepreneur if you've got responsibility? I don't actually know, but let's assume they're much more successful than us monetarily. But what's the point of being that successful if you've got all that responsibility yeah, and you, you can't, can't enjoy... enjoy the evening out? Yeah. I have another friend who is really successful in the Amazon FBA world. So he's got a huge brand. He employs, I think it's 40 people. He turns over um, eight figures a year. And he messaged me every, maybe once every six weeks or so, saying, oh, I'm so jealous of your life. I, I wish I could quit this. <laughs> like, obviously, he's had a bad day. He's yeah. like, oh, I'm so fed up of having to be in the office every day. And I'm like, why don't you do why that? Why don't you do some? Yeah, I'll show you. Why don't like, you make oh, I'm a change? I'm trying to like put someone in who can run it for me, but I'm, it doesn't really work like that. I'm still the most important. He's saying the business will suffer if I'm not at the head of it. Yeah. But so what if your eight figure business suffers and becomes a seven figure business? <laughs> like, yeah. Like why are you an entrepreneur in the first place? That's the question. And also in that situation, uh, there is no quick fix. He's not going to find someone overnight that's the perfect CEO. He, he might have someone in the business he could train up, but it would take him a long time to get to a point where he probably could feel comfortable to leave. But that's the thing that that, and then that's a lot of work, isn't it? It goes back to, well, why would you do that in the first place? So why doesn't he just carry on the way he is? Yeah, definitely. And what's the chance of him finding someone as good as him? Well, it's not. It's unrealistic. It's not going to happen, is it? Because yeah. if someone was as good as him, They'd be doing it themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so people like Richard Branson often say, you're never going to find someone as good as you. You've just got to accept that. And they say it from the point of view of business growth, that you can't then focus on the next business or the next part of your business if you're too busy working on one. So it's better to appoint someone who's not as good as you, who'll run it slightly less efficiently than you would, then you can go and build another one get that to just as good, then find someone who's just a little bit worse than you and then move on to the next one and do the same. And that's true whether you're trying to build the next huge startup. If you're running Google, you can't be in charge of Gmail, Google search, Google ads, all the different points of Google and still do it all. You've got to find someone who's not quite as good as you but is able to do it. Or if you're lucky, someone better than you. And it's true, I think, that if your goal is to just be a bit chilled out and enjoy your life and have complete control of your free time, which is what we want, right? Yeah. That, yeah, it's all right building a slightly suboptimal business that has that, that opportunity. I call myself the lazy entrepreneur. And most people who know me or who have read some of my stuff I'm like, well, that's a silly name. There's nothing lazy about you. Yeah, you're really productive. You do loads of work. Because they see the output, right? They see the different businesses that I've started and run. But actually, most of them don't take much work at all. And that's kind of the point. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you are always working because you're always thinking about work. And such a big part of your success is that you spend a lot of time on the strategy and like thinking through problems. You might not necessarily be constantly replying to emails or doing business meetings or whatever, but you are always thinking about either the next opportunity or how to improve a current business. 
that's a slightly different subject, I think. I think because I'm quite lucky in that what I enjoy doing when I have control of my free time, I quite enjoy starting businesses. Yeah. I quite enjoy thinking about them, thinking about the problems involved and, and working it out. But then when I do start one, I'm trying to start it in a way that it can be hands off. Yeah. And doesn't require my time. Yeah. But I think that goes back to people think, um, thinking you're really hard working. Mm. Um, and also that was the, one of the biggest things for me, like coming out of corporate world, looking at like how you work, that actually you really, um, focus on having a lot of time to think, which is something that I'd never thought about in corporate world. You're not given any time to think. The thinking time is when you're brushing your teeth, having a shower, your commute on the way to and from work and that's it. Yeah, we did a whole episode on that, didn't we? Um, not quite on that, but it was on serendipity. Yeah. And it's worth listening to where I was basically saying that you don't know what the opportunities, you don't know what your business is going to be in five years' time. You don't know what, what you're going to discover. But you need to be available to make the most of that and you need to have the time to come up with the ideas and to give them a go. Uh, and I said, I can't remember how... At the time, I did a bit of calculation to work out how much of my time literally is spent thinking and not actually working yeah. in, in quotation marks. And it was something like half the time or a third of the time. Yeah, which is massive. And and um, if your time was spent with lots of responsibilities, so I don't know, dealing with employee problems, like fighting fires with, I don't know, suppliers, if you're constantly doing that, you wouldn't have any time to think. Yeah, which brings me on to areas in the business where I have purposely got rid of responsibilities that are considered by most people a necessity. And I just don't do them, even though I know it's it's suboptimal. And so one of them is replying to emails, is I barely ever reply to emails. I barely ever read emails. In fact, now all my emails actually go to you because it yeah. got to the point where I was like losing so much business and yeah. opportunities from that kind of neglect. Similarly, I never answer the phone. I don't take any phone calls. You don't read any mail? I don't read any mail. I don't... Like post. I if mean. you send me a letter, I probably will never get it. Yeah. I don't... My phone doesn't vibrate. I don't get any texts. Like I do get texts, but they're only when I want to read them that I'll go through them. I don't have anything that intrudes on my whatever it is I'm doing at that time. And yes, there have been times where I have suffered for that. Yeah. Probably a lot less than you expect. It's very rare that an email is, is really important or a letter or a text. Somewhere else is with employees. Nowadays, I don't have any direct employees. I have partners who I have, who have equity interests in the business. So they have their, it's, it's in their interest to work on the business. Yep. I have outsourced businesses that I give work to and freelance contractors. Whereas I used to have an office full of employees. I used to have a coffee shop, which was full of employees. And I just realised it's just something I'm not very good at. And actually, we've done podcasts and talking about I should just hire someone in order to learn the skills better to be a manager. And that yes. it's limiting my business by not being a good manager. Which, yes, it is, is something I'm trying to do. But actually, if we're talking about getting rid of all responsibility possible, that's worked well for me. You know, you're quitting that. Being location dependent. So we did a podcast um, a couple of weeks ago about how almost any business can be run from anywhere in the world. Just often it's not as good. And that's something that I've put into practice a bit. When I was a professional gambler, that business was location independent. Like I had to be in a certain place because we had employees and we had servers in certain places. The men had to be in the same place. Even though you think about it, it's all online. I had a coffee shop. Originally, that was everything was one place. But then I've tried to take all of those businesses and get rid of the stuff that requires it to be location dependent, even if it costs more money. It was a bit harder to try and free me up a little bit. I think the same is true with you. When you first quit your job and you became, you started doing freelance marketing, it would have been easier for you to do that if you were based in London. Oh, definitely. Could have met with people for coffee and done interviews and 
yeah, it, I could have utilized the current network I had to get some work, which I couldn't do at all traveling. Mm, yeah, exactly. Same with the gym business. Going around to all the bars and restaurants is much easier if you're actually near the bars and restaurants. Yeah. It's a bit harder doing over email and phone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's quite interesting to talk about uh, one of our new projects, um, which is to try and franchise the Pilot Pass Gin events, so the farmers markets and, and gin festivals, because it's kind of pros and cons within this context, because yes, we will effectively be hiring people, but at the same time, we're trying to also make events happen without us being there. Yeah, so I think the franchise model is something we should do a whole episode on, because it's quite interesting, and it's something we're trying to put into place with Pipe House Gin. And I'm just saying it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both, but it's more on one side than the other. And the reason for that is that each franchise e is their own business. Yeah. It's like what I was saying by having partners rather than employees. Yeah. They have skin in the game. If you take McDonald's, for example, one option they had was to open all the restaurants themselves, all the McDonald's themselves, and hire staff for each one and have a regional manager who would do something for that. Another option was to give away a large chunk of the profit but basically let entrepreneurs come and open their own McDonald's restaurants. And they're different models. And yeah. for a long time, I couldn't understand why anyone would franchise out their business because you're giving away so much margin. But now I'm starting to understand it more and more, both from the growth perspective, it's much easier to grow if you're able to entrust hundreds of different little entrepreneurs with your business. But then also from businesses like us, where we don't want the responsibility of having to manage this huge team. And also it's scalable. And you've got a whole episode around creating a, a business that is scalable. And us, the four of us running Pipe House Gin, there's only so many events we can do within a calendar year. Yeah, especially given that it is a bootstrap business. So I'm not sure whether you've read the uh, articles we've written about our gin business, but we built the business, which was to distill our own gin and have our own brand for about £12,000. And then another episode we did, we talked about where do we want to take Pipe House Gin? Do we want to double down on it? It's the episode is called When Do You Go All In On Business? And we had this choice of do we take on investment and grow that business or do we keep it bootstrapped and lean and turn it into a more lifestyle business which would let us go travelling? So do we take on responsibility and try and turn it into a huge business or do we keep it lean? If we'd gone all in on the business, what we would have done is we would have started hiring an events team. So we would have invested money into hiring people who would be doing the work of the franchisees that we're now looking at. So now instead of having to hire people and that huge initial investment, we're instead looking for people who are going to buy into the business and become partners. Yeah. And yes, that is giving away a big amount of margin to them. But for a bootstrap business, which doesn't have much money, it's a lot more scalable. Even for a business with a huge investment, it's probably going to scale quicker if you get the model correct. You get so much more utility out of the creativity and ingenuity of or your franchisees than if they were just employees. Like, there's people who are going to be... We spoke earlier that you're probably not going to find someone as good as you. Yeah. Yes, we're probably not going to find someone as good as us at running the whole gym business, but we're definitely going to find people better than us at running market stalls, at running the localised events definitely. that we're talking about. And that is where I think the franchise model could work really well. But also, it's something we haven't yet done, we no. don't have experience with, it's something we're trying out. So that'll be something to um, to look forward to. But instead of talking about that too much, because we'll probably do a whole episode on that, let's bring it back to the whole point of this episode, which was why are you doing what you want to do? It's okay to be an employee, to work for a business, if that fits in with your larger goals. Like, why are you doing it? I became an entrepreneur for the freedom and control, not having a boss, getting up when I want, all that kind of stuff. If I did a Facebook-style startup, I wouldn't be getting any of that. No. But doing an Amazon FBA business, doing some of the more chill-out gambling stuff, doing this gym business like we're doing now, I do get that. So why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Maybe, actually, what you want, do you just want to make a load of money? 
Like, yeah. But what is that money going towards? Like, do you, why do you want a lot of money? I think is the point. Like, is it because you want to retire early and, and that, and you need to work out what your what you need to live off every year? And there are ways of doing it. It's not just about earning loads and loads of money. Yeah, yeah. There's a fundamental questions in there, like, yeah. not just why do you want to be an entrepreneur. If the answer is to make loads of money, well, then the next question is why do you want to make loads of money? Yeah. Is it so that you can lie on a beach all day doing nothing? Well, then probably earning loads of money is not the best way to do that. You can earn a little bit of money, and actually lying on a beach all day isn't very expensive at all. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've done a podcast on that, but I've definitely got a um, a blog post about that. You know, we told the story of the Mexican fisherman before. A rich businessman from America went on holiday to Mexico, found the fisherman he went out with, and they caught sort of one fish, went home, barbecued on the beach, had a great evening. The businessman was like, well, why didn't you turn this into business? You could hire a bunch of uh, boats. You could spend more time out there. You could make loads of money. You can expand your fleet. And they said, well, what will I do then? So, well, then you can start exporting it internationally. You can turn into a big conglomerate. You can be a multi-billionaire. Well, then what then? Well, then, you know, you've got loads of money, so then you can retire, and then you can, you know, move to a beach and spend your days barbecuing fish and <laughs> fishing. Yeah. Spend, so spend time with your family. Spend time with your family, yeah. Cool. This episode is a bit more about what are your motivations behind it, and make sure that what it is you're doing aligns with those motivations. Because yeah. I think we do tend to jump into stuff a bit too quickly thinking that that is going to get us our goals yeah answer all our problems when you haven't really assessed whether the goals are your true goals mm. or if they're actually just the means to your real goal and then secondly whether actually the thing you're doing is the best thing to get those goals to achieve those goals and I've definitely been massively guilty of that in the past even though I spent half my, as you said that's half my life thinking somehow I've man- I managed to get myself in a few problems this one we haven't even said is that if you have a job, you can quit that job. If you run a business, you often can't quit that business. No. Imagine this situation. You start a shop, you buy all the stock, and you fill out the shop. Now you have your entire savings sunk into that shop. And in your mind, that has value because you got all the stock. You're running the shop. You're earning less than minimum wage. It's really hard work. So what do you do? Where you can close down the next day, but then you've got all this stock that you can't get rid of. It's worth nothing. So you've lost everything you put into it. Or you can keep running it and keep making that money, keep turning that stock over. But you can't have a half empty shop. So every time you sell a bit of stock, you've got to buy some more in. So you end up in this never ending treadmill. And that is the same for some of the business I've been in, where we've taken on investment, got to be paying back those investors. So you're on this treadmill, even though it's not doing that well, just trying to pay them out. Had that with the tech startup, that we're all about the valuation of the business. And the business valuation is only based on how much it's growing, how good the deals we're getting. So you're constantly trying to grab the next thing. And there's never a chance we have a good time to quit. So with the tech startup, I managed to get a, a buyout, which let me quit. But that's not guaranteed. Like I could have, if I'd quit just like that, I would have lost all the money that we put into it. And time. All the time and money. We yeah. were spending, I think, £10,000 a month on the business. If I just quit, we would have lost everything that had gone into it. Whereas if you keep going, it keeps building in value and then eventually you might get a sale. Same with a corner shop. Same with running something like a coffee shop. You might have like a five year lease on the premises. Yeah. Anyway, that's all doom and gloom. Figure out your motivations. Why are you getting into this? Is the business that you're thinking of starting and actually going to get you to your goal? Or is it going to take you somewhere else completely? And is the goal that you think you want, is that actually what you want? Or is that just a means to an end? Like being rich is not an end. That is, that's leading somewhere. Like why do you want to be rich? What's that going to do? If you just want to be comfortable, that's fine as well. If you just want to laze around on a beach all day, listening to horse and carts trundle past your um, <laughs> your room while recording a self-indulgent podcast, you can do that as well. Well, thanks for listening. 
we've mentioned quite a lot of stuff here, so I'll put them all in the show notes, but some of the podcasts you might want to listen to are the one on serendipity. That's a very good one. There's one on what does it mean to be successful, where we talk about this a bit more. There's one on that you can run any business remotely. It's just probably going to be slightly worse than if you were location-based. And then I've got a bunch of blog posts on starting different types of businesses. We've got you know, one about how we start a coffee shop. We've got one about how we start the Amazon business. We've got a whole series which followed along in real time about how we started the Pipe House gin business, our gin brand. Uh, yeah, I'll put them all in the show notes. And yeah, enjoy. And if you've got any feedback, hello at samprecy.com. And as always, thanks for listening. Adios.